for a Christian, we know that this is not our home. This is not our, our final resting place. It, it is not here. This is not the place that we will dwell forever. It, it's with Christ in that eternal home, and we are reminded, and Paul was so aware of that, because in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, he talks about that he was torn, that he found himself torn between uh, two worlds. His desire was to go be with the Lord. Paul would say, man, how do you beat that? And how do you top that? That's what I want. I want to be with the Lord Jesus face to face. Man, I want to be in his presence. But at the same time, I know it's more beneficial to the church if I'm here to instruct, to encourage, to preach the word. And so Paul says, you know what? I am torn between the two worlds. So the scriptures remind us. And they call out to us and say, man, this is not our home. But today, we are going to see that our hope, our future, our eternal home is with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Take your Bibles as we're studying through 2 Corinthians together and reading through 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. As you're turning to 2 Corinthians I want to remind you, stay up with the reading plan. Man, if you're not reading through the New Testament with all, that you need to begin today. If you don't have a reading plan and you say, man, I want to be a part of that, call the church office and we'll make sure we mail you one. You need to be reading it because you're going to be lost when you go to Sunday school. In Sunday school, they're, they're teaching over what we're preaching. You're going to be lost when you come to the sermon because you've already read this stuff. And so stay up with us in the reading plan in order that you might receive the full benefit of reading together. And Sunday night church is going to be over our reading plan. And so you need to be reading through the New Testament together. And so go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if these earthly tents, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. In so as much, we have put it on and will not be found naked. For indeed, while we're in this tent, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, he had prepared for us, for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, for I say, I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul, again, reminds us of the capstone of this message, is that this is not our home. The first thing that Paul wanted to see is that is in heaven, and we'll be given a new body. You know, death is a great equalizer of every man and every woman. Death equalizes us. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter the skin color that you have. It doesn't matter where you were born, whether rich or poor, black or white or Hispanic. None of that matters. Death equalizes every man and every woman. We'll all go down that same road of death one day unless Christ returns for the church before that time. And we just don't know the day. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour or how it's going to come about, but this is what we do know, is that death, every one of us, will taste it. For the Bible says this in Hebrews 9, 27, and as much as it is appointed for a man to die once. The Bible reminds us that we're going to have a day in which you and I are going to face death. Notice verse 1, he calls this outward body that we have as a tent. A tent that 
is made of material that will dissolve, it will wear out, it will get holes in it, it will not last. And he says, we have this tent. And then notice what he says about the tent, that it is going to be torn down. And when he refers to being torn down, Paul was simply saying this, is that death is going to come. These bodies that we have, as much as we try to keep them healthy and exercise them, eat right, he said, look, this tent that God has given us, this body that we have, that it is going to be torn down. And you say, wait a minute. What we're talking about sounds a a, a little morbid, doesn't it? It sounds a little depressing that I would come this morning to get up and and come to service. And all we're going to talk about is something as morbid as death. But hang on, wait, what Paul is saying is that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. What he is saying is in heaven, we're going to be given a new body. Look with me in verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, we know. We know. It's an interesting word there for know. It's not the traditional word that we usually think of in the New Testament. It's a different word. In the Greek, it's oida. Oida is referring to that which you intuitively know. You know that you know because it's something that is inside of you. And for Paul, it is the Holy Spirit. And what Paul was saying is that I know this to be true because the Holy Spirit has revealed that in my life that we are going to have a new body, a better body, a heavenly body. He said, I know this intuitively through the Holy Spirit. We know. Oida. But set that aside just for a moment. Paul says we know, oida, intuitively through the Holy Spirit, but set that aside for a moment. We also know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, that Paul was caught up into the third heaven. And Paul saw sights, heard sounds, that were unbelievable. And Paul says because of what he saw that he received a thorn in the flesh to keep Paul from literally just going crazy. Man, I I can't live here anymore. I want to be there. So this thorn in the flesh was given to Paul in a sense to calm him down, to hold him down. And so Paul could say, oida, we know this, that we're going to get a better body because I know this intuitively through the Holy Spirit but I know it as well because I have experienced it. I've experienced it myself. I have seen it with my own eyes. And I know that we're going to have a far greater body. Look what's waiting for us. We're going to change this tent in. Look what he says. For a building. A tent. And we're going to exchange it one day for a building. We're going to give up the mortal body for an eternal body. We are going to give up the temporal for the everlasting. We're going to give up the natural for the spiritual. What is coming is just going to be unbelievable. What God is granting for our children. If you would like, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Pick up with verse 42 there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown as perishable body, but it's going to be raised, what? Imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it's going to be raised, watch it, in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it's going to be raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, but it's going to be raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, Paul said there also must be what? A spiritual body. And so what we find is that the best is yet to come. We're in these old tents. Some of them are a little loose, right? Now, they're not as taut as tight they used to be. They don't hold water as good as they want. They leak a little bit. But you know what? 
Man, we're going to exchange that for a building, a spiritual building, a spiritual body that, that God is going to give to us. And we read later in Revelation that it talks about this body. It talks about what we are not going to experience anymore. And, and John writes, he says, you know what? We'll never taste death again. Somebody say amen. Man, we'll never taste death again. Nor will we mourn, nor will we cry. No longer will we feel pain. We will be eternal. And what an exchange that will be to exchange these old tents for an eternal spiritual building that God is going to give us. It's going to be great. And then he says, above that, in heaven, we're to be given a perfect home. A perfect home. In these tents that we live in right now, we face the effects of pain, sorrow, suffering, grief, frustration that come. Anybody can relate? Say amen. Two of you can relate. <coughs> I'm reminded of, of the story that was found in a Florida newspaper. And it kind of speaks of the frustration that we find in, in this world. Let me read it to you. A man was working on his motorcycle on his patio, and his wife was in the house in the kitchen. And the man, still holding the handlebars, was dragged through the glass patio door, and their motorcycle dumped onto the floor inside the house. The wife, hearing the crash, ran into the dining room and found her husband lying on the floor, cut and bleeding, and the motorcycle laying next to him, and the patio door shattered. The wife ran to the phone and summoned an ambulance. And because they lived on a very uh, large hill, the wife went down several flights along the steps to the street to direct the paramedics to, to her husband. After the ambulance arrived and transported her husband to the hospital, the wife uprighted the motorcycle and pushed it back outside and seeing that gas has spilt on the floor, the wife obtained some paper towels and began to blot up uh, the gasoline and threw the towels into the toilet. The husband was treated at the hospital and was released to come home. After arriving at home, he looked at the shattered patio door and the damage done to the motorcycle. He became despondent. He went into the bathroom, sat on the toilet to smoke a cigarette. You're knowing where this is going, don't you, already? After finishing the cigarette, he, he flipped it between his legs into the toilet, into the bowl, while he was still seated. The wife, who was in the kitchen, heard a loud explosion and her husband screaming. She ran into the bathroom and found her husband lying on the floor. His trousers had been blown away, and he was suffering burns on his buttocks and the back of his legs and his groin. The wife again ran to the phone, called for the ambulance, and the same ambulance crew who dispatched came and met her at the street again. The paramedics loaded the husband on a stretcher and began to carry him to the street. And while they were going down to the street, the, the company of the wife one of the paramedics asked his wife how the husband burned himself so badly. She told the paramedics what happened, and one of them started laughing and tipped the stretcher and dumped the husband out on the ground, and he fell out on the ground and broke his ankle. Have you ever had one of those days? It seems like those days just last and last in this life, doesn't it? And we find those frustrations and we find those things that happen to us. But notice what it says in verse 2 through verse 4. Listen to what Paul writes to the encouragement that he gives. He says, For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we 
having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Paul looked so forward to that day that he was going to be clothed with his new heavenly body. And Paul was just thinking through all that in his mind as he was riding through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and said, one day it's coming that we are going to be clothed with our new heavenly body and it's going to change everything. And, and we find that new dwelling is going to be a perfect place. But notice what he says. He said, why we are in this life, we groan. The word groan is talking about an intensity. It's talking about a, a passion in, in one's life. And he says, right now while we live, there is a groaning in, inside of us as believers that we want to be clothed with our heavenly bodies. We want to be in heaven. We, we desire to be there. And he said there is that, that groaning, that, that unction, that, that earning as with inside every believer. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 22 through verse 23 reminds us that we're not the only ones groaning. It's not only believers that groan, but listen to what it says, for we know that the whole creation groans and it suffers the pain a childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having this first fruit of the Spirit, even as we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoptions as sons and the redemption, listen, of our bodies. Paul says not only do we groan with this intensity of wanting to be clothed in, in our new heavenly home, but also creation is groaning. We realize that creation has been affected by sin as well. Uh, it's not, we find that, that Adam, the Bible said that he would toil in the ground, toil in the soil, and it would be that time. But we find that when we occur our new heavenly bodies, that we will be in a wonderful place called heaven. And there, there will be no more frustrations, no more pain, no more sorrow, no tears, no battling with sin, no more limitations of our frailties. It will all be done away with. Look in verse 4. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Look at that last part. You might want to underline that in your Bibles. Swallowed up by life. What is Paul saying? These mortals, these mortal tents that are going to be torn down. It's going to be engulfed by heaven. It's going to be engulfed by that perfect place that you and I will dwell again. And the only way that Paul could describe it was say, it's going to be swallowed up by life. We talk about when we come to Christ, we receive life, that abundant life. This is talking about that abundant life on steroids that we are going to be in that perfect environment of heaven forever and ever and ever. And Paul would say to you today, how many of you are ready? How many of you are ready for that, to enjoy that, and you look forward to a, a new body, a heavenly body, and you look forward to heaven? And so we've been saying on earth that you're going to receive what? A new body. In heaven, you're going to receive a new body. In heaven, you're going to receive, what, a perfect place. But now on earth, he changes it. On earth, we're given a pledge. You know, Paul goes on and on, talks about, man, it's, good, it's going to be great. We're going to receive these new buildings. This tent's going to be torn down. And man, it's going to be perfect there. It's going to be swallowed up in life. The greatest thing that you could ever imagine in life is going to be more than your mind can ever imagine. But is Paul, the typical preacher, 
just yeah, 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 yeah. We might want to ask, how do we know this is true, right? How do we know this is true? How do we know it's going to come about in our lives? I want you to notice first, in verse 5, the verb, prepare. As I said before, I think it was last week, verbs are very interesting in the Greek subject. In the Greek language, they they say so much. In verse 5, it says, you're going to be, look, notice, prepared. One scholar said it this way. He said the verb prepare can mean diligently working with in someone, much as an instructor trains a student in anticipation of graduation and service. What he's saying is, is that God has been working in your life. Right now that God is working in your life, preparing you for that day, for that day that you will be in his presence. He's preparing you. He's working beside you, preparing your life. But again, we ask the question, how do we know these promises are coming back? How do we know they're coming back? How do we know that they're going to be backed up by God? How do we know? Notice what it says, that God has given you a pledge. And what is that pledge? He's given you the Holy Spirit. Wow. You see, God has made all these promises to us. And God has never lied He's never gone back on his word, but he's saying, listen, more than just to give you a promise, I'm going to do more. I'm going to give you a down payment. I'm going to give you an assurity. I'm going to bring you and give you to dwell in your life the Holy Spirit. And listen what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life in Ephesians 1.14, who has given you a pledge of our inheritance with a view to redemption of God's own possession, to the praise and glory of God. What he's saying, listen, man, I, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. It's my promise, it's my guarantee, it's my pledge that he is going to take you and present you before the Father. Listen to what he says in 2 Timothy 1.12. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard that which I have entrusted to him that day. Who is the one that is guarding you? Who is the one that is going to bring you to the Lord? It is the Holy Spirit. And he is our pledge to know that all these promises, man, they are as sure as life itself. But nothing will ever interfere with it. Some of you can really mess things up. If that's you, say amen. Amen. You know, you can get things so scrambled, so messed up in life. But listen to what the Lord says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, 35 through 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. But in all these things, we're overwhelming conquerors through him who loved us. For Paul said, I'm convinced of this, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities or things present or things to come, or nor powers nor height or death or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, you are eternally secured in the Lord. Man, how do we beat that? How do we beat that? Man, we've got a a better body that is coming. It's going to be like the body of Christ and his resurrection. We've got a better home, perfect home that's coming. And until that time, the Holy Spirit indwells in our lives as the down payment, the guarantee that these things are going to come about. And he's going to hold us for all eternity, and God has never lost one of his children, not one. But there's something else that Paul wants to say. In heaven, 
We are given an eternal presence of Jesus. It's like Paul just keeps ratcheting it up. You know, like at a baseball game, there's a bat. Someone will grab a bat, try to find out who's going to bat first. One person will put their hand, another one, another one, until you get to the top. It's like Paul is ratcheting it up. And he said, listen, don't you understand and don't you know these old tents, they're going to wear out, but it's okay. Man, God's got a building waiting for us, a spiritual place that we're going to dwell in, and he's going, to, he's going to clothe us in spiritual clothing. And we go, wow, wow. And then Paul tops it off, and he says, hey, forget all of that. Lay all that aside, which is true. You're going to be with Jesus. And man, when the congregation read Paul's letter, they were just like, you're telling me that's enough. We're going to be in the presence of Christ one day. And Paul wretches it up to the very top. And he says, man, how good is that? That we're going to be in the presence of Christ. We could join in with Jim Hill who wrote these words of that song that, sing, that we sing. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. And when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he, took, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. And we would say amen. What a glorious day that will be. Oh, forget, we're getting a new body. We're, we're getting a perfect home. Oh, that's great. But the greatest thing of all is that we will be face to face with Jesus. And Paul says, listen, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your frustration, he said, take courage today. Find courage. Notice that word in verse 6. He said, be encouraged today. Why? Because you know through the pledge what is waiting for you. Notice again, he, he says it in verse 8. Twice he says, be of good courage. Once in verse 6, once again in verse 8. Man, don't get discouraged, he's saying. Don't get despondent in this world. You be of great courage in this world, even in your heartache, even in your loss, even in the times of your disappointment and your frustration and your trials. Why? The best, the best of all is to come. And Paul so desperately wanted to be in the presence of Jesus. A pastor received a letter from a nine-year-old girl, and it goes like this. It says, Dear Pastor, I hope to go to heaven someday, but later than sooner, love Elaine. Out of the mouths of babes. Many of us would echo those words that, yeah, we want to go to heaven, but we want it to be later, not now, not with Paul. Paul would say, man, what does this world hold compared to what we're going to have in heaven? You remember when Paul said in Romans chapter 8, the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the future glories that are ours in the Lord. Paul so wanted very much to be in the presence of Jesus. There was an aged missionary couple that was coming back from Africa on a ship from a lifetime spent in service for the Lord. 
And as they were coming back, they kind of thought of it as their glorious homecoming. And on the same ship as they were on, there was a famous person on that has been gone away for six weeks hunting. As they arrived at the port, there was a crowd waiting. Also, there was a band. And the famous person gets off the boat, and everybody on the boat and on the shore was gathered around. The band played. And the missionary looked at his wife, and he said, that should have been for us. That should have been for us. They walked alone to their modest hotel room. And the missionary sat on the bed. And again, he brought it up again. He said, you know what? That should have been for us. We've given our lives in service for the Lord. And we come back and there's nothing Nobody to greet us, nobody to give any applause to. And his wife said, you know what, you need to change your attitude. She said, I'm going to go out for a while for a walk. And you just need to spend some time with the Lord. And to see what he would say to you. And so she leaves and she goes out of the hotel and takes a walk, and she comes back in. and She says to the old aged missionary, she said, did you do what I asked you to do? And he said, I did. And she said, what did the Lord say to you? And he said, the Lord said to me, my child, don't fret. You're not home yet. And my friend, don't fret. Be of good courage. This old world, it's not your home. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come for each of us in the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you have given us in your word today. Eternal life is a promise to every believer. A perfect body not made with hands. A perfect home not made with hands either, but constructed by you. So, Father, in our frailties and our weakness, Father, we pray that you would encourage us, that you would allow your word to bring strength and encouragement to our lives today, to know what is yet to come. Steady us, strengthen us to walk another day knowing what you have prepared for us. We're not home yet, but one day we will be, and we praise you for what is waiting for us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You know, the promises that have been given to every believer, they're only for a believer. If you've never received Christ, my friend, I can assure you this, you're not going to receive a better body. And I can assure you, you're not going to receive a better home. You'll have an eternal home. But it's a home that you will never want. It's a home that was made for Satan and his demons. Because you're in church today, you cannot say that I can claim these promises. It's only for those that know that have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to give an invitation today. And if you've never given your life to Christ, you need to think about it. Because as I said earlier, that death is the great equalizer of all men. 
and women. We don't know when it's coming, what day, what hour. But at that moment, it'll be too late. You've already sealed your eternal destiny, either heaven or hell. And you're here today, and you say, man, I don't know. I want to nail it down. I, I want to know that I'm going to receive that eternal body, that eternal home. I want that pledge. I want the Holy Spirit living with me. Because one day, I want to be able to open my eyes, and I, I want to see Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. I want to see him. The Bible says we look through a glass dimly, but then face to face. If you're not sure about your salvation, you've never trusted Christ, man, today, nail it down as we stand and sing our invitation. Let's stand together. Thank you.